Good morning. Uh, this is Masato Yamanish, uh, policy secretary. So I would like to start policy succession of APNIC 41 meeting. So uh, I will explain agenda. Uh, today we have two sessions in this morning. And uh, I will explain agenda item in these two sessions in later, but let me... Oh. In this meeting, I think everybody <laughs> confused how to move slide in each session. On? Ah, got it. Okay, now it works. Okay, first slide uh, mentioned about policy charter. So our charter is developing, oh, developing policies and procedures which relate to the management and use of internet address resources by APNIC, NIRs, and ISPs within the Asia Pacific region. Then mailing, this mailing list is sig-policy at apnic.net and web address is this one. And who's who? So uh, as I explain, I, as I introduce myself, I'm Masato. Uh, I'm I'm working as policy sig chair, and co-chair is Sumon Ahmed Sabil. Then I think it is a good chance to introduce NRO and current NRO NC member. So uh, where's after? I heard from him, he's coming. But anyway, when he will come, I will introduce him. And yeah, AJ, Dr. AJ Kumal could not, I cannot attend this meeting, unfortunately. And Tomohiro, can you stand up? Yeah, he's Tomohiro Fujisaki. Okay, then next slide is talks about current action items. And actually, uh, all we, uh, we had three action items, but all are implemented or dissolved. So first and second action items, which are Paul 39, 01, and 02, are related with a proposal which was, uh, which, which reached consensus in previous meeting. So uh, these two proposals are implemented to the policy, then Adam will explain a little bit more detail about these two action items in later. Then third action item is poll 3903, and it, it means uh, Prop 115, which, was, uh, which could not reach consensus in last meeting. But however, after the discussion over the mailing list, OSER decided to withdraw on this one. So this action item is also resolved. So currently, we don't have any action item right now. Okay. Then steps to implementation. Usually, I explain these steps, but in this meeting, we don't have any uh, any official proposal, so let me skip this slide. And however, we have uh, several informal informal sessions. So let me explain consensus decision making. Even though we will not ask any proposal uh, for consensus in this meeting, so consensus means general agreement taking into consideration comments on the mailing list and also in this meeting. And uh, chair gauge or measure objections, whether it is minor objections, which means there are some problems may occur for some members of the group, but it's not end of somebody, or, or it is major objections like major problems will occur for parts of the community or some members. Then also another important point is participants should work together to resolve ob objections. So even though 
this meeting, we don't have any official proposal and official discussions. Please do not forget about this point because it is a, uh, these are principle of our SIG discussion. Okay. Then uh, in last, how many meetings we are using this one? I cannot remember exact number, but anyway, we are recently we are using uh, confer to measure consensus. Uh, traditionally, we use raising your hands, but we are also using this tool as uh, additional tool. But still, it is transition phase, so chair may use both way or either way. Depends on each case. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, uh, even though this slide doesn't mention about it, it, but I think all registration in previous meeting are deleted, right? Not, not this time. Which? <laughs> okay, got it. So if you, you have registered in previous meeting, your information should, be, should work still. So you can use the same credential and password to log into Confer, I believe. Then if you have not yet registered, uh, it is very easy to register yourself. So please go to this URL and click register. Then, uh, yeah, as, as I'm saying multiple times, this meeting, we don't have any official proposal, but actually uh, from last meeting, we received two proposal, but uh, both of them <coughs> could, uh, both of them didn't lead to material status for the discussion. So chair decide not to accept it. But since it is proposed, uh, let me explain uh, summary and why it could not. It could not lead to. It, it could not. Yeah, we. The, let me explain the reason why chair did not. Uh, chair didn't accept it. So first one is a propose, First one proposed allowing IP before delegation to come from the same pool. Uh, no, no. So, sorry, I should not read this text. So right now, uh, if user applies for slash twenty one then it is approved. Still, user will receive one slash 22 from uh, 100, or 103 slash 8 pool and another slash 22 from non uh, 103 slash 80 pool, which is IANA returned address. So since these two pools came from different proposal and different policy, it is current practice. However, this, propose, uh, this proposal proposed to uh, allocate one slash 21 for such applicants. Then, uh, but draft text, text was not so built up. It's, it, it was very simple text, just mentioned just a couple of things. So Secretariat explained the background of these two pools and also revised some text. But after that uh, conversation, there is no response from author. So chairs decided uh, we could not move forward this proposal without, without active participation of the authors. That is the reason why this one is not uh, this one is not accepted, and second proposal is uh, uh, oh 
sorry, I forget to mention about one thing in previous one. So actually, even though I said we received this proposal after previous meeting, actually it is submitted just before last meeting. So I think some people already know about it, but this one, second one, is pretty new one. Uh, I think we received somewhere in January, I believe. Then uh, it is very, it is also very short proposal. Then uh, I think this author is not so comfortable about uh, APNIC current practice. And he claimed that every who is contact regarding email address should be contacted once, a, once per month to make sure it is valid and responsive. Uh, then he also claimed that if it is, if registered email address is not valid or is not responsive, that, you, that address space should be revoked. Or in other words, it should be terminated. That is the concept of this proposal, and but text was not so mature. Actually, mm, let me say it was it it was pretty emotional text. <laughs> so we asked to re revise text and revise and resubmit that proposal, especially in problem statement. However, Osa said he doesn't want to continue the, this discussion, and he withdrew this proposal. So that is why we could, not uh, we could not bring this proposal to the discussion. Okay. So. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Adam. So, yeah, I forget this one. So, but. Secretariat, Secretariat agreed that we may need to explain current practice about such uh, unresponsive email, unresponsive contact more to the community. And also, we have, certainly, we have some problem. So in second session, Epinic Secretariat will explain current practice and also that issue. Okay. Anyway, this is agenda item in first session. So I already explained the administration slide. And as next item, Adam will explain implement implementation update about Prop 113 and 114, which, are, which reached consensus in last meeting. And also he will explain about, I think you changed the title of this presentation, not? Same con contents, okay. Anyway, he will, uh, he, Adam will, will explain his idea how to promote or how to invite more participation to the policy discussion. And uh, fourth item is a consultation on register registration of detailed assignment information. So actually it comes from Prop 115. Uh, which, which was with the with in last week. Then last item of first session is uh, Jeff's presentation and he will present ad address statistics in 2015. Okay. Oh, you wanna, you wanna say something about? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm Tomohiro Fujisaki. Yeah. Please go back one slide. Yes, I'm Tomohiro Fujisaki. And the fourth item will be presented by the Hiromi-san remotely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am here so I can answer the question, but yeah. Presentation itself was made by, will be Hiromi-san, yes. Yeah, Luli is the first author of this presentation. So this time she will present by WebEx. And, but Tomohiro is a co-author, so he will, uh, he, will, he will respond to answer or 
uh, he will respond to questions, I think. Okay. Then uh, this is a gender items in second session. So as I said, as I explained, uh, this session is related with uh, second unaccepted draft proposal. So APNIC secretariat explain current practice about this this matter and also uh, present some problems. Okay. This is a diff difference, but let me skip it. So that's all about ad administrations, right? Is there any question or comment? Especially for agenda items? Is it okay? Okay, so Adam, please present your two presentations. It's a long walk to get here, isn't it? Good morning, everyone. My name's Adam Gosling. I'm the policy officer at APNIC. Put your hand up if you can't hear me properly. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Good to see you paying attention. Uh, I've got two slide packs to go through, and I'll um, try to get through them and maybe take questions at the end. First off, we're going to um, talk about the implementations uh, that we've just completed, as Masato mentioned. So since we last met, we've had uh, Prop 113 and Prop 114, which reached consensus in Jakarta. Uh, there was a bit of work to do. It wasn't too heavy. Some changes to the application forms and my APNIC was implemented on 10th of February. And I'll just have a quick chat about those individually. By the way, sorry about the green square at the top of the screen there. That is uh, Hiromi-san waiting on WebEx to do her presentation later. <clears throat> uh, so the, on the screen there you can see there's a proposal at the top and then how it's been implemented in the documentation at the bottom. Uh, basically the idea of 113 was to uh, relax the criteria uh, for IPv4 assignment. Uh, Basically, I guess the, the um, big change there was that there was quite strict multi-homing um, requirements um, and quite a kind of tight frame, time frame. And uh, it was argued that, that people should be allowed to set up their network and then choose when they want to multi-home. So now they have to kind of indicate an intention to multi-home rather than do it within one month, I think it was before. Uh, that was fairly straightforward. I guess there's something I want to mention about 114, which is the modification of ASN eligibility criteria. Once again, there was... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, once again, there was some... Um, a, a relaxation of the multi-homing requirements. And the implementation of this meant that um, people applying for an ASN no longer have to provide two AS peers in their application. Uh, they have to tick a box indicating that they intend to uh, multi-home in the future. The thing I wanted to mention about that, though, was particularly in the proposal, if I can, um, it talks about provider independent space provided by APNIC. And in implementing that, we took quite a liberal view um, uh, felt that the, the author's intention was that it was anyone that had their own space should be able to get an AS number to go with it. And, and whether it was actually assigned by APNIC or it might be legacy space or it might be space assigned by another RIR, um, because we do have applicants wanting to bring, to use their RIPE addresses, for example, um, but want an, an AS number that's uh, located in, in our region. So in implementing that, we did take a liberal view and I kind of deleted the by APNIC part so that um, anyone who holds previously allocated provider independent address space, so that could be legacy or another RIR. 
so I hope that's all right. I think that was what Aftab and Skeev uh, really meant. Um, moving on there, um, a couple more things. So those are the implementations that we were asked to do. Uh, the next one isn't really an implementation of our policy, it's an implementation of someone else's policy. So the RIPE NCC implemented their transfer, inter-RIR transfer policy on the 1st of October, and we had to implement our half of that to enable transfers. And as I suppose everyone knows, we can now transfer V4 and AS numbers with the right region. Just a couple of links to documents there, anyone who wants to read up on that. Um, a little project I've been working on is to provide a change log for the document archive. The, the archive of official policy documents is on the FTP. It's not very user friendly. Uh, and uh, I thought for transparency reasons and ease of access, uh, I could probably do it a, a little bit better. So that archive is still there. It's still the official archive, but I'm making it easier to get at from our website. Um, obviously, the objectives are greater transparency, make it accessible, and make it easier for me to analyse. What happens uh, quite often is people will say, when did this policy get introduced or changed or whatever? And actually, I kind of have to do this backtracking and, and comparing the proposal policies with the documents and the, na and the number, and it takes a long time. And so I'm, I've just kind of done this. Um, so I've only done it for the V4, V6, and AS number uh, policies so far. So I've got a couple more to do. Of course, these documents are now obsolete because we have the single policy manual. So this is really archival. Um, and, but basically, as you can see, it's got the, the document number, when it was published, the link to the FTP, a markup version of the changes and a description, and the, the red line change just kind of looks like that. Um, it's something I kind of work on. It's, it's not a lot of work, but it's something I kind of delve into when I feel like doing it. Um, and, and I'll do transfers, and there's a little bit more to work to do on, on these descriptions, um, and maybe tidying up the red line versions. Um, that's about it on that, if anyone is kind of really interested in, in the evolution of, of APNIC uh, policy, then it's a great place to go, but I think I'm probably the only person. Uh, another um, thing I want to talk about is the IANA returns pools. Uh, as Jeff reported at the last meeting, the, this pool um, is the result of the global policy for IANA returns and Prop 105, um, which established a second pool for people to get a second 22. Uh, as Jeff reported, this is going to exhaust soon, or, or maybe deplete might have been a better word, because it gets topped up as well. So as it gets used, more IANA space, as Elise Garrick um, reported, is added to it. But those amounts are getting very small. Uh, next week we'll get a slash 15, in September we'll get an 18, I think next March we'll get a 19, and it goes on for a couple of years, but it's a, it's a real trickle. Um, other things that go into that non-103 um, pool is the recovered blocks. Paul, uh, sorry, Jeff also uh, noted last meeting that we have a lot of recovered space, terminated space, in our quarantine. And so we began a process to uh, return that to the available pool uh, last October after that meeting. Um, some of the 103 space was put back in the 103 pool and it's already been delegated and it should be in the recovered pool. So to fix that, we're kind of going to take a little bit of 103 space and move it across just to balance up where it should be. It's, a, it's not a lot of space. It's uh, about 50. 22s, which is a bit, uh, bit less than a 16. The big issue, I guess, with the IANA returns, um, as we discussed after the meeting last, last, uh, last Jakarta meeting, uh, when this pool depletes, it's going to kind of bounce. And I nearly kind of drew something, but I guess everyone can imagine that um, we're talking about April or, or, or May, maybe. You can never tell, but sometime very soon we're going to hit rock bottom and there's going to be nothing in that second pool. Then that's even after we get the March delegation. But then as we put recovered space back in it and then in September when Iana gives us the other 18, um, 
it's going to be topped up again. And so similar to what happens in the Aran region, the Secretariat proposed on the mailing list after the Jakarta meeting that we would uh, create a waiting list for unmet um, uh, requests. And basically we kind of um, got, got a good response from some of the people in the community. It, it wasn't a huge response, but it seems like a fairly straightforward approach that we'll create a waiting list. Um, we've started working on it. It'll be done in a similar way, I guess, to the V4, phase three V4 exhaustion, where we'll create a very strict order. And um, in order to do that, we, I think it's a, as a slash 16, we'll stop the NIR um, partners taking um, their own um, resources out of the pool and they'll have to be included in the queue. So it'll be a very strict order of um, receipt of the request. And we're proposing at this stage to make the list public. And that might be something that um, the community might have an opinion on. The Aaron community makes theirs public and I think the... Owen's kind of not 100% sure. I guess the advantage... Please, Owen. Uh, Owen DeLong, Aaron AC. We, we make the um, queue public to the extent that we say what size blocks are on the list. We don't um, give out the names of who's in the queue. Right, okay. Um, so it is, it is something, because there is obviously commercial and confidence, commercial privacy issues in there if, if you're waiting for a request. This is a maximum of 22, I guess, so it's kind of not, not um, critical. It's not someone looking for, for large blocks. Um, the advantage of having the list quite public is that you can see where you are on the list. Um, and maybe it could be anonymized. Because, uh, so you're gonna be looking, oh, I'm this far down on the list, uh, there's another allocation on, in September or March, or you can, of course, the terminated space is kind of not uniform, it can come in fits and spurts, and it can be a big block or it can be a small block. Um, it's something that maybe we can, we can talk about on the mailing list. The idea is that we will post more details, like we did with the V4 exhaustion, put it up on the website, um, post that to the mailing list, and, and before we have to implement it, um, get some feedback on that. But that, we're talking about April, um, so that's quite close. Also, this has kind of raised a discussion within the Secretariat. Um, the, the way Prop 105 is implemented, it says that Members must take from the final slash eight, the 103 pool, before they're allowed to access the non-103 pool. And we're actually not that far. I think it's about a slash nine in the final slash eight. Uh, and so that, at some point, is going to empty. And even though we would have addresses in the non-103 pool, you wouldn't be allowed to access them because you haven't got a 103 block first. And I know it's counterintuitive, but it's quite clear in the policy that that's the way it works. And so it's something we're going to have to um, work on between now and when that happens. One final point um, in this presentation, uh, Prop 101, if people can remember, it's back um, 2012. Uh, we uh, removed the multi-homing requirement for IPv6 assignment. Uh, it's not that you can't apply for that, but it, it kind of said it, it's not an absolute prerequisite. Um, so it meant that if you had a technical justification for having a V6 um, assignment and you weren't multi-homing, you could, you could get one. There was some concern amongst some community members that this might spike the amount of V6 assignment. And so we were asked to track it. and. It's a while since I've shown this because I promised not to show the graph anymore because nothing was happening. It was implemented there at the beginning of 2003 and you can see the URL if you want to track it yourself but it didn't make much difference although I did check at the beginning of this year and it blipped a little bit in 2015. I'm kind of not um, planning to keep showing this every meeting but uh, just because it had gone up a bit I guess I thought I would mention it. Now that's all I have on that. If I can just move on to my other presentation. 
Uh, is there any comment or question? Owen. Uh, Owen DeLong, Akamai. If you could go back to the uh, implementation of the inter-RIR transfer, I'm pretty sure that was implemented 1 October 2015. <laughs> Not 2016, is that correct? Correct. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks. I had uh, the wrong date. I, I put 1st of October 2016, which of course hasn't happened yet. That's all. Then uh, I, ha I have one question about second pool. Mm -hmm. Can you go slide up? That Sorry, way? can we put... This or the waiting list? Yeah. So last is last bullet item talking about which, which second pool you are talking about in here. Uh, okay, sorry, I'll just explain that again. So, so we have two pools as we've been talking about. One is the final slash eight, which is network 103, and then all of the IANA and any return space goes into the non 103 pool. We call it. Um, so that's a, a recovered space list. So we have the final slash eight and the recovered space list. Um, in the policy uh, at the moment, it says people who have had a block from the final slash eight may access the recovered pool. And so new members coming along, if they can't get a block from the final slash eight, they can't have anything from the recovered pool because you must have 103 before you can have non-103. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So I, I guess we can either, it could be treated as an editorial change because it, it's counterintuitive, it doesn't make any sense that we say, I'm sorry, you can't have any of this space because you didn't have any of that space and there's no more of that space. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a little yeah. confusing, I hope. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So let's move to second presentation. Uh, so, um, as Masato mentioned, I've changed the name of this to be facil facilitating participation um, I, because I'm going to talk about something that we've um, spoken to the chairs about this meeting. Uh, so, at the December APNIC EC meeting, they agreed to a proposal for us to support travel for SIG chairs. So, that's basically two people per SIG per meeting. Uh, if, if the idea is the chair for every meeting and the co-chair, if there's more than one co-chair, they should alternate. Uh, there's probably some flexibility on that. So I've talked to the uh, chairs of the Cooperation SIG and the NIR SIG about this, and I've um, briefed the policy SIG chairs. So that's basically the, the terms. It's, it's um, just enough to make sure that people can come along to the meeting and fulfil their obligations. Uh, and the idea is to to um, allow people from developing countries whose, whose um, organisations, employer may not be willing to support their travel. Uh, sometimes we have meetings in very expensive places and it's difficult. So, so just to allow developing country participants to have a fair shot at that. Uh, it's there, I don't need to go into the detail too much. Yes. Yeah, go back to the previous slide. Let me add more background about, yeah, travel support for chairs. Because the reason why uh, the, the, back, the background is the number of person who runs to chair and co-chair election is becoming low and low. So actually in policy SIG, uh, in Fukuoka, I mean, second last meeting, we had co-chair election, but there were there are uh, there there were no there were, there was no no nobody stand up. Then in last meeting, we had co-chair election again, and 
Sumon was only or only on, only only the person who runs to that that election. And in my case, also there was no other person run to the to the to chair's election. So that is why uh, this one uh, we are prepare uh, we are setting up this support. Thank you, Chair. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more detail to the policy than that, but I figured um, that will eventually go up on the on the website. I've brought a draft for that to get feedback from the chairs. I've had a couple of suggestions. I need to take that back to my managers and say, uh, can we tweak it like this or that? And then I'll pop it somewhere on the website, I guess, for, for reference. Um, so we, we're... Uh, been talking about, about participation in, in the SIG and, and there are some barriers to participation, I feel personally. Um, I think language is, is one difficult one for some people. It, there's awareness. Um, there's, uh, we've had two authors come with very poorly structured proposals um, that just we just couldn't bring to you. Uh, and so uh, before the last meeting actually I, I wrote quite a detailed um, guide to authors which is now on the website. I guess it's not really well known that it's there. Um, another thing that I've been working on, and the information has been there, and we've been talking to some people about it, is to have a kind of champions program. Um, these are representatives uh, of, of an economy or a community who are volunteering to kind of be the middleman and, and to encourage discussion uh, in their community, whether that's a NOG or an NIR. Um, for people who have been in this group for a while, um, they'd be aware the role Azumi played for the Japan community um, was, was so valuable um, that she uh, was able to kind of be the middleman, uh, middle person um, between that community uh, and, and the um, AP Nixig. I see this as a potential way for some of those communities that, that aren't, don't have a strong presence in the SIG um, to, to develop their their strength and and so we've been kind of working on this and and there's been some lukewarm interest. Um, I did go to one economy and spoke to the NOG and they said, oh no, no one in our country will do that. So I'm not 100% convinced this is going to work, but it's an idea. And so over the through this year, we'll be trying to recruit people um, when we go to NOG meetings to find people who might be interested in in kind of uh, encouraging policy discussion in their region or their sub-region. Uh, so that's the, basically the idea. It, it's, um, I'm kind of still looking for, for ideas about how this, what's in it for them, I guess, um, and, and how this can uh, develop over time. Um, so one of the things that we've discussed in the office, and we haven't gone very far with it, um, but I've got kind of a, approval in principle that we could divert some of the regular APNIC fellowship funds or tag them as a kind of a policy fellowship. And, and it it's, has potential, again, for, for people who can't fund their travel or their company won't, won't fund their travel, for them to come along. Obviously, it's much easier um, to participate if you're in the room. Sometimes it's just a bit difficult. Um, not really clear on the implementation of that, and anyone who's got any ideas or suggestions uh, would be really welcome. Um, uh, one, one option we've thought of is that the fellows, some fellows do show an interest in it and, and normally a fellow to an APNIC meeting can only come once. If you've been to an APNIC meeting, you can't be a fellow again. And so one suggestion was that we, fight, as, as fellows do come and show interest, we say if you'd like to come to a second meeting, you could come as a policy fellow. Um, another idea is, is that um, authors could have could be sponsored to travel here um, or wherever we are to present uh, their proposal. Uh, I guess one of my concerns with that is that people will just put forward proposals in order to get the travel. Um, maybe we could offer travel for policy champions. Of course, I don't have a lot of funds for this, um, but you know, some kind of rotational basis or something like that. Um, it would probably be, be only be one person per meeting. And, and I guess even um, once we work out who 
would qualify, it would about, be about who decides because there's um, possibly more people interested in the travel support than there is um, money to go around. So, so would we ask the chairs to, to select someone uh, or the secretariat or um, form a committee, which is the way our current fellowship program works. Um, it's a committee specifically do that. Um, we can either ask that committee to, to pick a policy fellow or we could have an, our own committee. Anyway, so that's some ideas that I'm kind of bouncing around at. If anyone's got any suggestions or comments now or later, it would be really great. Um, I think that's all I've got. If anyone's got any suggestions, please let me know. So is there any comments or question or suggestions? Morning, everyone. We are Tom from New Caledonia. Um, I just want to say that I completely support what you just uh, proposed, because it's it seems from discussing uh, discussing with uh, other people that everything related to the policy is equivalent to politics. It means that only certain people get to propose in. Uh, well, everybody else just sits there and say, yeah, I agree, no, I don't, or... But it's like uh, something you can't reach if you're not within the right circles. So, yeah, it's a very good thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. After. After, after thinking. Um, I would totally agree with him. Like, it's uh, the same faces again and again. Myself, one of the culprits as well. So... The thing is, uh, I just want to know one thing. Um, the policy champion uh, program, which you are uh, planning, is it something related to the policy mentor in Aaron, if I'm not wrong? I'm not even aware of that. That might have, sorry, I'm not, not aware that they have one. Anybody is from Aaron can from Aaron, policy mentor in? Oh, Shepherds? So, uh, is that along, along Aaron AC. Um, we have a few different things that might be what he's using that term for. We don't have anything that I know of under the term policy mentor, but we do assign mentors uh, often from the AC and sometimes from other sources um, to uh, interact directly on a one-to-one -one basis with our people who receive fellowships to attend our meetings. Uh, and then also each policy gets two shepherds from the AC who are the primary AC member is responsible for moving that policy through the process. Yes, thank you, Arne. No, I, I don't mean shepherds. Um, the the um, shepherds are an integral part of the PDP in Aaron. Uh, I'm not sure that we would want to change our PDP in that direction. Um, so, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, if someone puts in a, a proposal, we would call it, um, uh, I think Aaron calls it a draft policy, and, and the AC gauges if there's enough community support to carry it forward, and then they assign um, one or two of their 15-member mem uh, group to be the representatives for that proposal, and they're the ones that carry it forward and fight for it. Um, we don't do that. We have an author who puts forward a proposal, and then it, they are expected to carry forward and fight for it. I'm not proposing to do that. Uh, I'm not proposing that we change the PDP. This is people just liaison, I think, and to say, people to say, oh, have you seen Prop 114 in, Skeeve does this, I guess, on the Osnog list, for example, have you seen Prop 114, it'd be really good, it'd be really bad, whatever, and just try and generate some interest and comment, and, and the, the, I think it would probably have to be informal. When Azumi has done this in, a, in the past, it's been to represent a very clear JP position um, as a, coming out of their OPM. So it's a very structured thing. Um, I, I think probably a NOG is not gonna go to that extent. So, so I don't think they could really stand at the mic and say, I, I represent the, the Malaysia community um, because there's, there's no structure behind it. Hello, Azumi. Hi, um... Okay, Izumi, go ahead. So um, since my name was mentioned, and mm -hmm. I, I totally support this initiative of uh, policy champions, I think it's a good initiative. And what uh, we've been doing in Japan is, of course, we do have um, 
our own policy forum. But in addition to this, we also try to introduce um, some of the policy proposals to JANOC uh, when we see that it's relevant to the operators community. So we don't actually introduce every single uh, policy proposals when it we, we feel that it doesn't directly like relate to operators, but for example, when it's related to, to four byte ASN or anything around who is, um, then I think it affects the operators. We actually make sure that um, uh, we try to introduce it in their language. So I think uh, this is a really good initiative. And I also want to comment about um, APNIC fellowship for policies. I think it's an excellent idea. And since the, I, I see the opportunity is limited, one person per meeting, I really want to think of a way, what would be the maximum uh, way to make this fund effective? And in my personal opinion, it seems that if we can accommodate policy champions, then they can actually spread the words uh, within their community. So it's, it's a really good way of encouraging others to participate. And to make it fair, I think it would be good to set up some kind of committee or, or yeah, just for transparency. That seems to be a common uh, practice in many of the uh, fellowship um, um, opportunities. So my two cents. Thank you. Can I say one comment about support? I think we also need to consider when we will select fellow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Before, before call for proposal or after call for proposal. I think it's pretty important in this case, I think. Yeah. After. Yes. Um, uh, two things I just want to mention here that uh, the whole concept is absolutely brilliant. Um, the, the, in ICANN Fellowship, what we do is like we have returning fellows option. But for that, we, we not only from, uh, from the fellowship committee, we take feedback from the uh, other uh, people in the region that what, what, what's the uh, position of that person in the region, how is he giving back to the community and how was his uh, contribution in the last event he attended. So you get a good feedback from the, uh, from the fellow members and then you can decide. So if you, if you were planning to do something like that, then please consider that as well. And the second thing I want to mention is like, um, we are talking about once somebody proposes something, we don't have a proposal today, <laughs> right? And uh, the reason is we have made it so difficult for a newcomer to propose something that it's just a no-go thing. So you have to be like, uh, be here six, seven years to get the courage to even propose something. So maybe it's time to just loosen up something. And uh, every proposal is a good proposal, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, it creates a community engagement, and it creates discussion. Um, from the very first day, I'm against proposal 115, but it has created a lot of discussion. And it is good for the community, people learn. Um, I learned a couple of things, so it's a good thing. That's what I would say, thank you. Thank you. Sanjay. Sanjay from APNIC. Uh, about the support to participants. I think uh, we also need to think about uh, probably helping the discussion in the country itself, in the economy itself, and not focusing our funds just to get people to come here. So I would suggest that uh, uh, we also look at helping the local discussion take place. Um, and hopefully through there, they would then have the initiative to also pull resources to send people over. So I think strengthening the local community is probably one way to, to, uh, to do this. Thank you. Okay. Sunny? Uh, you mentioned my name, okay, Sunny Chandy from APNIC. Uh, in regard to the question of selecting fellows uh, before the proposal submitted or after, I think it's very critical that the current process, we allow at least uh, four weeks' time for the fellows that from the time we select, 
and uh, they can apply for visa. It depends, you know, what country, the economy, the conference is, and sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy process. So I think something that to consider uh, when you want to select the fellows. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems, uh, I think we need to continue discussion about this matter all over the mailing list, but right now I don't see any more people. So, uh, but thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Presenting for these two presentations. Great. Thank you. Okay, so let's move forward to fourth item in this session. Sorry, I forget the title. <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, this so can you switch to WebEx? Yeah. So, yeah, now I could see him here. <laughs> So fourth item is a detailed assignment information in WHOIS database or other sources. Then it will be presented by Luli first, and we will move to the discussion. Then I'm not sure how long uh, the, how how long this presentation takes, but we have thirty thirty minutes in total. So okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead, Luli. Uh, and yeah. thank you, thank you very much for uh, presenting it remotely. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Ruri Hiromi, one of the authors of Proposal 115. Today, I want to talk about possible solution of detailed assignment information and why we believe it, it is important for the internet users. Uh, here again, uh, in the beginning, uh, I show a problem statement from Proposal 115. Uh, in the document, we wrote that uh, there are some cases needed to get IP address assignment information in more detail to specify the IP address. And uh, without detailed information, Operators cannot filter out specify, uh, specific address range, and this might lead to over-filter. Uh, currently, Internet of Things is expanding, and uh, I take one case for the uh, IoT device network. Uh, please look at the drawing. Uh, this is IoT networks in the ISPY and the uh, malicious devices what is on the corner of the left side in the part of IoT network A. Uh, from allocation information, it says slash 32 is for ISPY. ISPY assigned slash 56 for each IoT network, but ISPY is not registering the, the assignment information of each device network. Uh, here, another ISPX wants to stop the attack from the malicious device. ISPX assumes assignment size of ISPY uh, to the IoT device uh, will be slash 64 but uh, could not stop the attack. Then, ISPX set filter size of slash 32. The attack is stopped, but all IoT networks in the ISPY is filtered. If assignment size information could be provided, the ISPX is able to set the filter safely. And uh, here is another aspect of the detailed information. The allocation and assignment information is used for 
the statistics, especially for the IoT, researchers want, uh, want to know the growth rates of IoT devices. In this case, detailed information must be helpful, helpful for the statistics purpose. I can say that uh, registration information will be needed for various purposes. Uh, so I explained why detailed information is important to us. And I ask one question here. Uh, do you agree with us to provide detailed information? If yes, we want to move to the next topic. So I, I, went, I, I couldn't stop the presentation. I move to the next topic. Uh, so all of you may understand the needs of detailed information now, uh, but how we provide them? Here I picked up five possible solutions. The first one is using Huiz database. The second is the using domain name system. The third one is using internet regi uh, routing registry. The first is think about other database. The last one is using routing information. So about uh, the first uh, one, uh, using who is database. Uh, this is a sample image of using who is database. Uh, remarks field is very useful and use this field for the assignment size. Or add new field for assignment size is also useful uh, if it agreed with APNIC members. So uh, I emphasize that the policy originally said the allocation and assignment information should be registered in the FURIES database. Please remember that. And I move to the second solution. The uh, solution number two is using domain name system. Domain name system is also useful for this purpose. Uh, the domain name system has text resource record for free words. If a registry decided to use this resource record for noticing the assignment size, it may appear like this image. For basic use of domain name system, uh, get domain name from IP address uh, by re reverse lookup, then Query for text field in the target name zone by a forward lookup. Uh, to get answer faster, we have to consider resolving mechanism with that and discuss with DNS people. So um, the next is the, about uh, solu solution number three. Uh, the number three is using internet routing registry. IRR is able to provide assignment size information too. Uh, and uh, here is an image of this. We will be able to use remarks object or description object uh, for this purpose. At this time, we have to discuss with IRR people too. The uh, next two solution is here, uh, but the solution number four is build a database from the scratch. This means we develop a brand new information service. And then solution number five is using the routing information system. But there uh, no almighty routing protocols. Uh, there are plural routing protocols uh, so that we might have to be remodeling all of the routing protocols. So, uh, 
So I showed you uh, about five possible solutions. Uh, here is the next question. Uh, which is the best technique to provide assignment such information? Uh, now, uh, today uh, we want to get feedback from you. Uh, any comments are appreciated. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, Luri, thank you very much. So you'd like to discuss, uh, firstly, you'd like to discuss first question, which, yeah. Yes. So, so you want to ask whether the community uh, agreed to provide detailed information or not, okay? Yes. Okay, so is there any comments or questions about this point? Thank you, Gala. Actually, it is very most difficult point. This most difficult thing is nobody coming to microphone to to, to ask. <laughs> Gala. Um, hello, this is Gala Father from Lineup Networks. Actually, this has come up before, and I don't see a point behind this policy. But at the same time, with IoT, I don't think there is an easy way to say this is for IoT. Say, for example, I have V6 assigned by my provider at home now, and at least part of that goes to my Nest box and a bunch of other stuff that these days have V6 by default. So what is my ISP going to do? So they're going to tag me as IoT now? Right, so I, I just don't see a point of how this is going to be used. I mean, I think there's some device in my car these days that can do V6 and it'll just catch onto the nearest V6 network. When it is in the garage, it'll connect to the house, get V6. When it's on the road, it might connect to my phone and use, if I'm on T-Mobile, then it'll get a V6 from T-Mobile, right? Like the whole, it's pretty conflicting, right? You are talking about internet of things that can be everywhere, and you're also trying to say, hey, we'll fix them into this block of IP address so that we can block it or categorize it or do something with it. So, and you know, and as you, you said, uh, Masato, that the data is only as accurate as the people put information in it, and I don't see that happening. So, yeah, this whole proposal doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. So, about uh, policy uh, relationship with policy, uh, I suppose the, uh, that the data related to the uh, question number two. Uh, if we choose uh, using FUI's database, uh, it's, uh, it help uh, relationship with the policy. And uh, uh, the second question is for the IO, uh, we, I pick up IoT network. So, uh, but I, uh, so uh, any, any kind of networks uh, would be okay to the, this proposal uh, because the, I, the main topic of this is not for the IoT or something like the uh, specified uh, what kind of network. Uh, it's, uh, I want to know is the uh, just the address range, uh, which is the uh, better size to filter out. That's all. Tomohiro, you, you ha do you have further comments? Ah, yes, yes. I'm Tomohiro Fujisaki from NTT and second author of this the proposal. And yes, this is not direct answer to the uh, Garab's question and comment, but the big, we propose this proposal because in IPv6 case, we, the other assignment tend to be, be uh, fixed, not the directly changed like IPv4 DHCP case, and also the assignment size will be 
different from ISP and ISP, and also in one ISP, the environment, environment because, for example, the, uh, some ISPs assign search 56 to the uh, consumer service and search 48 to the uh, enterprise service and search maybe 64 to the uh, mobile service. So even in one ISP, the assignment size will be changed. So we would like to know the, uh, the size, assignment size to hold the uh, safe server operation or the safe network operation. That, that's because we propose this. <coughs> okay. Bertrand. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Bertrand Chirier, Micrologic System, New Caledonia, again. Um, I understand the idea behind the proposal because you have to work out a way to blacklist uh, different kind of uh, bad users. But the same we do with IPv4, when there is one IP address that's been assigned to a customer, the, uh, the ISP does, doesn't go to the APNIC website and fill up the who is for this just one address. Uh, I don't see, uh, we're deploying IPv6 uh, in a very uh, few uh, weeks now, and I don't see myself just got 12,000 customers because we're a small country, so it's easy compared to millions of people outside. But I don't see myself going to the website and, and filling up uh, 12,000 times the Whois database. But on the other hand, when you blacklist an IPv4, you don't blacklist a slash 8 or a slash, even a slash 24, you blacklist one IP address. So. Uh, Yes, you can blacklist one uh, each time a slash 64 for IPv6, but you won't, will never end up uh, blacklisting a slash 48 or even a slash 56. Thank you. Hi there, Donald Clark from Google. Just on the blacklisting point, um, when we do when people may blacklist an IPv4 address. Sometimes the smallest they may be able to blacklist for policy reasons might be a slash 24. And even a single IP address on v4 may be natting a whole lot of users behind it. So I think those relationships in terms of um, actions to impact need to be borne in mind as well. Aftab Siddiqui. Um, I don't... Um, totally agree with this uh, whole idea of giving the information here. It's like, uh, at the end of the day, we'll be, <clears throat> uh, we'll be cleaning up uh, all the stale information in next two, three years if we ever go with this in this direction. I would seriously refer to the RFC 1925 and point number three. I would really suggest people to read that once before continuing the discussion on that. Thank you so much. Rajesh Charya, President, Internet Service Provider Association of India. While logically we agree to this proposal that we should inform the dedicated IP address which we are giving to our customer so that if anyone is doing any bad thing or wrong thing from the internet, it should be disclosed and it should, the information should be available. Because right now, if we are not able to give that, all the information are coming to ISPs and then ISPs in turn has to contact their customer, which the customer don't believe. So it is better that we should be able to fill the information of the dedicated pool which we are allocating to the customer and the abuse thing or anything which is going, it should go directly to the customer with the information to the ISPs also. Uh, my name is Mark Foster. Uh, I'm with Niwa, but speaking personally. Uh, regarding that last comment, if I am witness to or victim of abuse on the internet, I would not contact the abuser to complain. I would contact their service provider 
and expect that service provider to enforce terms and conditions on that person. Um, contacting the abuser is often not useful uh, and whilst I understand the elegance of being able to have who is information updated to that degree, uh, as has already been said, it's not going to be kept current. Uh, so I think that's probably going a step too far. Thank you. Rajesh Charya again. Reason for my suggestion for putting the name of the person who is using the IP address particularly was that because when we are going into the court for the legal case, at least the customer should be taken into the target and the service provider should also be knowing about the facts. Otherwise, what will happen? It will be the responsibility of the service provider to inform to the court that this is the culprit. My reason is not that the customer should not, uh, customer should also face the heat of the issue, what he is doing. Yuya Kawakami from JPNAP, but speaking as a personal. And uh, I have uh, two slash 48 address in my home. And uh, this proposal would be very useful to uh, if the content provider uh, I like to do uh, filtering. Because so if uh, without this proposal, so content providers have to filter with a slash 64. And uh, I have about 120,000 slash 64 in my home. If I am a summer, so the content provider have to write uh, 120,000 uh, access list for free filtering. And uh, this, I, I, I don't say agree or with, disagree with this proposal, but uh, this information would be very useful for operators. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid some comments are going to how to, whether we should specify end user or how we will specify end user, but I think it's different from this proposal. <laughs> but, Garo, go ahead. Back to, uh, this is Garo Padaya from Limelight. Actually, I have a question to you. Um, what do you think operators are going to update for the, you know, maybe 10, 20 million customers that they have in Japan? Are they going to have time and resource to actually go and individually update that information somewhere? Because as, as a content guy, I think if you build filters, we'll just build filter on the specific IP address. I'm not going to write rules for thousands of slash 64s. That, that's how I do my network, but question back to you. If you are an operator, would you actually go and update information about your five million customers on a public database? Owen DeLong, Akamai, speaking for myself. Um, as I understand the proposal, or whatever this is, it's not really even a proposal yet, um, the idea is to be able to specify for a large block prefix such as a slash 24, 28, or 32 that an ISP gets, um, a predictable assignment size that are, is what you put all of the subdelegations into. Um, that doesn't happen in most networks. Most networks uh, that have slash 32s or larger end up uh, carving out some slash 64s and some slash 48s and Maybe some of them do slash 56s for reasons passing understanding. Um, sometimes you carve out larger blocks that are uh, collections of 48s that then get delegated down into eventually 64s elsewhere in your network. So there's all these different things that tend to go on. And so specifying a single prefix size for an entire um, covering aggregate, uh, to me, seems like it would be in most cases, misleading at best and outright useless at worst. You are from JP NAP again. And uh, just, just an answer for the girl's question. So uh, operators should not write uh, uh, 5 million customers filter. And just uh, with this proposal, the operator, uh, operator just know that the assignment size is uh, for slash 48. The, uh, the operator 
register uh, sorry information that or operators should register to the public database is just assignment size slash is slash 48. That's enough. Give me one second. So uh, we are now 10.20, so I need to conclude this topic within a couple of minutes. So after asking Dean's comment, can I close the microphone? And I have another question to the author, whether do you, uh, do you want to measure community's view about quest first question? You wanna, you wanna measure? Okay, so since it is not official proposal, chairs will not decide whether it is leached to the consensus, but we can measure, then author can decide next step. Okay, is it okay? Okay, so Dean, go ahead. Dean Pemberton, Internet New Zealand. Um, there, there are significant privacy issues if, if you're going to look at extending something like the Whois to take indiv individual end customers of ISPs and, and put their details on the internet. One of, you know, one of those issues is around awareness and consent. Um, you know, you may find that just because a user signs up to be, you know, a member of an ISP, that they have no idea at all that their information could end up being publicly available. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that even though there are, there are some benefits that, um, that they wouldn't be outweighed by the disadvantages, how much you be careful of the privacy aspects. Thank you. Uh, so this is um, Izumi speaking, not necessarily from JPNIC, but as an observer of the discussions. So I get an impression that a lot of the feedback is based on misunderstanding of what this is proposing. So this is not about um, registering each customer information, as Yuya, Yuya has clarified. It's about just simply uh, identifying what is the size of the customer assignment for a particular range of address space so that um, this will be a reference in our filtering size or, or blacklisting. I think that's a basic concept and I think a lot of the feedback was based on like a different understanding so it would be useful if we can proceed with discussion based on a common picture and understanding about the issue. So um, I think if the idea is to continue discussions, I think that would be useful. Just an observation. So, uh, George, go ahead. Okay, George from APNIC. Um, if I can uh, contribute a little bit more how I understand this. Uh, the question one is asking uh, if the community agree to add that information in assignment, uh, which is in INET num, INET 6 num. Uh, my understanding is currently in the remarks field, it's an optional field. And um, those who manage the address space can provide that information in there. Um, so, basically, if you wanted to put additional information, it is possible, that's my point. Sorry, let, let me ask, uh, ask, let me ask a question also. Is author's expectation just sharing assignment size? In other words, assignment size is just one example of your use case, or it is a uh, concept of this proposal, uh, this, of this idea. I think people is confusing about that point. Yes, Tomohiro Fujisaki, the proposal, one of the proposal. Yes, just want to know the assignment size. For example, could you please hold the slides once? Uh, one more, please database case. Ah, uh, sorry. Yes, yes, this one. So this is one example. This example shows the, the study to case, but just we would like to know which range 
uh, assign size of that range. So in that case, this is thirty two, but I need six num with thirty five. This is the customer assignment assignment block, and the size is just thirty uh, forty eight or fifty six, and so on. So just want to know the uh, customer assignment size only, not for the further information. So, so assignment size is not example. It is your intention. Of yeah, this idea. Okay. exactly. Yes, but as even so, I think Ga Garo's point is still like uh, how can I say make sense or effective <laughs> because you have a concern about the volume of this work, and also you are not sure about whether it is actual problem or not. Anyway, so uh, we are running out of time. So let me ask your view about first question, whether we, we, we agree to provide more information about assignment size or not. Then this time you have, uh, this time I'm not ready for comfort, honestly. So <laughs> let me ask by uh, raising your hands and I think, I think it's okay. So then, then this time you have two, only two options. First one is you basically support this idea and would like to continue this discussion. And second option is opposite. You, you don't like this idea and don't want to continue the discussion, okay? So if you uh, basically support this idea and want to continue this discussion, please raise your hand now. Okay, so if you can, you, you can down your hands. Okay, so if you, uh, if you don't like this idea and cannot support to continue, uh, cannot support continue this discussion, please raise your hand now. Okay, thank you. So as I said, since it is not official proposal, chair doesn't decide whether it leads to consensus or not, or whether it will be abandoned or not. But also please uh, decide your next step based on this community's view. Yes, Tomohiro Fuzaki again. Yes, thank you for your discussion. Thank you for your input. We also discuss how to proceed this proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. So last item in first session is Jeff's presentation about address statistics in 2015. <laughs> yeah, this time, why we have stairs opposite side from podium? <laughs> I will be quick. Um, my name's Jeff Houston. I'm with APENIC. One of the more important parts, I think, of my role is to actually provide you, the policy community, with feedback. Feedback about what actually happened in the internet and why. And try and see to what extent the objectives you are trying to fulfil with these policies were actually realised in the network itself. So, as I said, this time round I will be relatively quick if there is information you would like presented in future address policy meetings, I will try and incorporate it if I can find it. But this is data actually drawn from the network itself. Um, you all know this is happening. The only RIR left with addresses is Afrinic. Afrinic's consumption has increased dramatically in the last few months of 2015. Um, RIPE and APNIC are working through their last slash eight at a relatively orderly fashion. There's no panic going on. Lacknick and Aaron both are down to their absolute last gasp. In the case of Aaron, they do have a slash 10, but it's not marked as available. 
So you actually see them hovering at the bottom of the line because there's just no other block space. There is a tiny bit, but the conditions are that they don't mark it as available. Lacknick still has a slash, I think two slash 11s. It's a slash 10 and they're drawing through that. Current projections, I went through that in September last year. AP Nick on this block has approximately five years to go-ish, unless something happens. So, so far, the demand rate of the blue line is relatively orderly, has been for the last few years. Um, this is the big picture I did show this yesterday in transfers. Basically, we reached a peak of a quarter of a billion addresses in 2010, and obviously address exhaustion has tempered that demand. The silicon industry isn't slowing down. I think there were 1.2 billion devices manufactured last year. You know, the industry of the mobiles in particular is just rocketing. I believe India is now doing a $5 smartphone. So the supply side is vertical. Our ability to give them addresses is now non-existent in V4. The overhang is enormous. Um, in terms of address allocations, the table basically shows that as APNIC ran out, countries in economies like Indonesia and India disappeared from the top 10, and then the ripe NCC runs out, Russia and Germany disappeared, and by 2013 it was sort of America, Argentina and Canada. Uh, when LACNIC ran out, those countries disappeared, and in 2015, the countries with the largest allocations included a cloud provider in the Seychelles. I'm really not sure what's going on there. A mobile provider in South Africa, two mobile providers actually, and allocations in Tunisia, and that residual AP network uh, allocations into China is basically our last slash eight pool. Um, the aftermarket, as you're well aware, and we've talked about this a fair deal, you can't use IPv4, sorry, V6 and just ignore V4. This is a dual stack world we're living in, and you've got to do both. So obviously we're seeing a lot of network. Uh, obviously we're seeing a lot of virtual hosting. Uh, we're seeing even bigger and better tricks where, if you will, thousands of web addresses don't just share one address, the entire data center is just on one address. So with clever tricks in both the DNS and in HTTP, we're seeing more and more address compression. But there is still an aftermarket and we've certainly seen two kinds of transactions discussed at some length yesterday. Uh, direct sales, where we see it in a registry, and forms of leasing and other beneficial control, where the registry details are unaltered, but if you will, the person who's looking after that address and doing the day-to-day -day operations is not the person in the registry. Here is the stats for address transfers from the logs, the number registered per year, and of course the volumes. We do note and acknowledge, and certainly been clarified for me this week, old legacy addresses in RIPE, I understand, those address holders have direct write access into the database in RIPE, and are able to effect a transfer without necessarily having that recorded in the transfer log. And doubtless Ingrid or someone can correct me if I've got that rough summary wrong, but my understanding is that I'm not able to see this directly in RIPE's published log, but it's happening and in some ways more detailed investigation either by RIPE or by me or by both of us would uncover a figure there. Um, the 37 million addresses in Aaron um, dominated by movements inside 47 and 52 slash 8. You've probably seen their cloud rollouts. It's pretty obvious what's going on. This is something I showed yesterday. It's actually really quite interesting. We are moving further and further back with transferred addresses. Last year, 80% of the addresses in the transfer logs were more than 20 years old. If I could accurately get ripe, it might even be 90% because it's the old ones that aren't actually included in RIPE's transfer log. So my suspicion is it's, it's, it's really bigger than that, and I'll certainly give that a try to see if I can find it. That was V4, it's over, it's a V6 world. Um, 2015, um, you saw a little bit of sort of, just after 2008, global financial whatever, things started moving. What I find sort of strange in some ways is that each, the big allocations are now enormous. 
So in the case of, of LACNIC and so on, you see sort of a couple of big allocations that absolutely dominate the numbers and then they go away again. So those are the number of address allocations. Uh, the, the, it's millions of slash 32s. I got the slide axis label wrong. But as you see, it's growing, but not as quickly as it was. Um, those are the number of individual address allocations. So as I said, the volume's just tapering off. Um, the number of addresses that actually go out, you can actually see there now the two large V6 allocations to mobile phone providers in Africa kind of make Afrinic have a really big year last year. So those are units of slash 32s per year in volume of allocated addresses. The one that's been consistent has been the RIPE NCC, that the volume of V6 addresses in terms of V6 slash 32s has been dramatic. Aaron, big years, small years. APNIC, big years, small years. Last year for both Aaron and APNIC was not a big year in terms of number of addresses, similarly with LACNIC. So addresses moved out the door in AFRINIC and the RIPE NCC. Um, hard to trend that kind of data, isn't it? Sort of wavy lines, it's sort of going somewhere, but I've no idea where, we'll find out. Um, same top 10 country table, and you know, the top of the country table of who got the most addresses was indeed South Africa with those two mobile providers. Uh, second was China. Large allocations in the UK, which is actually matched by conscious efforts in that country to actually do deployment. Deutsche Telekom in Germany is basically, and that's the major provider, backed up with Cable Deutschland, is doing a huge deployment of V6 in Germany. And again, the figures kind of show it. Um, the Netherlands has small units of percentage of V6. So now they've got marginal amounts of addresses, I expect to see something, we'll see. And the remainder is actually, as you see there, Spain, Italy, and oddly enough, the United States small this year, top of the table last year, highly variable. Um, so this is the full picture I showed this yesterday of the, this is all addresses all over the planet. So the top row is the amount of V6 addresses that have got allocated. And in terms of totals, since 2011, we're doing approximately 20,000 slash 32s, which is the equivalent of, quick maths, around about a slash 20 per year is leaving the registry in V6. And it's been pretty consistent. V4s, fine until 2010, no more left. So that's declining. Our transfer registries are certainly showing 10 million, 10 million, 20 million, 60 million. And if I could add right, my guess is it might be 70 or 80 million addresses transferred last year. How many addresses are leased? Don't know. My suspicion is that last year we saw something of the order of around 14 to 15 million in addition to what's in the transfer log but I'm going well beyond rock solid data when I say that. So I would say that's a suspicion. What's behind a NAT? Oh, well, let's just have a lottery. None of us know, no academics know. It's really, really hard to tell. On the industry side, as I said, 1.2, 1.3 billion bits of silicon in smartphones, tablets, whatever. Most of them find their way onto the internet. My guess is that the full number is that that last column, what's behind NATS, is, is the big column with nine digits in it. Highly likely. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go through routing because folk have been pressing the routing alarm button. There is no need to press the routing alarm button right now on the data. The V4 network is growing linearly. The exact rate for the last few years is 47,000 per year. Oddly enough, the industry is even more ordered. 3,100 AS numbers appear each year, uh, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere, because down here in the Southern Hemisphere, and indeed in Asia Pacific, we don't seem to like ASs very much. We, can, we go through about a tenth of the number that our counterparts in, collectively in RIPE and, and Aaron get through. Um, more specifics are one half of the routing table. That's been the case for the last 10 years, nothing to see. We are routing finer and finer addresses, but there's no cause to panic. So we're now down to, I think if I read it correctly, God, that's a long way away. Oh, look at the slides. You can see the average announcement. We're getting close, I think, to an average of around a slash 22. Um, 
business as usual, nothing to panic. V6 used to be strongly growing, no longer, around about 6,000 a year. That's a bit of a disappointment. AS numbers growing at about half the rate of V4 at this point, around 1,600 ASs per year. I don't know why I put the word prefixes on the slide, brain lapse. Um, more specifics, take out one third of the routing table because if it's good for V4, it's good for V6 as well. So we all do traffic engineering in 6 now. I actually think that's a sign of a mature technology. And interestingly, just like V4, the average advertisement size in V6 is indeed getting smaller, predominantly because people take a slash 32 and start playing with traffic engineering slash 48s. And yes, a slash 48 will make it most places. The only place where it's debatable is whether a slash 64 will make it everywhere. But there are a lot of more specifics and they tend to be around most of the net. Uh, last but not least, the six measurements. I do not measure the folk who come to Google, and that's a different metric. I try very consciously using this measurement technique to bias my numbers against the user populations in each country. And that gives far more weight to countries and economies like China and India, where the V6 numbers are a lot lower. And across the in excess of 3 billion users right now, we see between 4 and 6% of users, when tested at that global level, can respond in V6. It's certainly a lot more than last year. It's certainly growing. But it is still a relatively small number, and that's a problem. So the weekend numbers are higher than weekday. That's an indication that in terms of the retail ISPs, V6 is taking off more in the consumer market than the corporate market. Your own work lives might indeed confirm that. And the difference between preference and capability is probably that little margin of Mac users, where Macs, up until very, very recently, just tossed the coin as to which they'd use. Now, like Windows, those systems are now, if they can use V6, they generally will, and that's filtering through on the numbers. Good news, it doubled in 2015. There's the global map at the start of the year. Lots in America, lots in Germany, lots in Norway, lots in Peru. Well done. Here's the map at the end of the year, in fact, at the start of this year. Yay, Canada. Um, Finland decided to do something. Um, Brazil decided to do something. And Malaysia decided to do something. Uh, hats off to them. So as you see, let's do this again because it's cute. Start of the year, end of the year. Slowly and surely, less red, more greens and yellows. We like that. Um, in terms of a world average at around 4%, those small number of countries are above it. They tend to be countries with high GDP per capita. As John Curran reminded me yesterday, correlation is not causality, but it's kind of sad that, you know, there is money involved and countries that can afford it tend to be more rapid adopters than those that can't. But so saying, Romania did an amazing job. Peru has done an amazing job, so it's not necessarily totally GDP correlated. Um, we're here in New Zealand, where we're seeing it around 2%. And just to be specific, hats off to Orcon, hats off to Snap, to everyone else, you're doing an absolutely lousy job, get with it. Uh, and I think that's the end here, yeah, thank you very much. I'll leave that up, the New Zealand list of fame and shame. Um, I've, I've well exceeded my time. I've tried to go as fast as I can. I'm sorry. If there are questions, I'll take it. Otherwise, back to you, chairs. Thank you.